Ms. Jocelyn Spence, and I serve as the Director of Mental Health and Wellness for the National Benevolent Association of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. And as our intro video noted, please note that you may follow along during the webinar via automated transcription using the AI-generated captions. You can look for the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And note that we will also have a question and answer period at the end of our time together, but please feel free to share your comments and questions during the webinar using the Q&A feature or by using the chat. So we welcome you again for being here with us today and for watching at a later time. As a general ministry of the Disciples Church, the MBA collaborates with leaders and with health and social service organizations to strengthen and transform communities through compassion, healing, and justice. An MBA's mental health and wellness program focuses on creating these communities of compassion and care with an integrated vision of wellness that prioritizes a holistic approach centered in justice, equity, theology, spirituality, and clinical awareness. In 2020, over 50 million Americans reported experiencing a mental illness. We know that number is probably higher in 2024 and was higher than due to the number of people who did not report experiencing a mental illness. We also know that one in four people will be diagnosed or experience a mental health challenge in their lives. And over half of them will never receive mental health treatment for a variety of systemic reasons, a variety of access reasons. Yet we all know that a part of that lack of accessing care is because of stigma. Despite the prevalence of mental health challenges that people are facing every day, that we all know someone who has dealt with a mental illness or a mental health struggle, and knowing that about 43% of United States adults are taking medication for their mental health, near 90% of people believe that there is mental health stigma. So we could ask anyone and they would probably say, there's still a lot of stigma around our mental health. At MBA, we work to eradicate mental health stigma and cultivate acceptance of diverse mental states and experiences through the sharing of mental health stories and the equitable sharing of knowledge, resources, and support services. Thus, our theme for this year's Mental Health Awareness Month is reducing and overcoming stigma and increasing support. And throughout the month, when you check our, our website, our socials, we will be providing resources, have been providing resources and opportunities to assist you in reducing stigma and increasing support in your congregations and community as we continue being a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world where centering our wellness can sometimes be challenging. And so today I am pleased to be joined by a panel of wonderful professionals to provide us with some insight and wisdom on how to overcome this stigma and increase support around suicide, medication usage, and other tools to support our congregations and communities with their mental health. Today, I am joined by Denise Santano Lamas, and Denise was born and raised in Puerto Rico. She is a licensed clinical social worker in Florida. And for the past few years, she has been an active advocate in the field of suicide prevention. She served as the president of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, Central Florida chapter, and was a member of the national board for the same organization from 2020 to 2023. Currently, Denise is in the Leadership Council Diversity Workgroup Chair, and she is the founder of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention Puerto Rico chapter. In February of 2023, she became certified as a Soul Shop Trainer, which is an interactive workshop equipping faith community leaders and other people of faith to prepare their congregations to minister to those affected by suicidal despair. Throughout the years, she has received several awards and recognitions, and in 2012, she followed her dream and created Hispanic Family Counseling Incorporated, where today she serves as the CEO for the agency. Currently, she is working on obtaining her doctorate in social work at Walden University, and she is a founder and has been an active member of Iglesia Cristana Hispana, North Orlando, since 1996. Welcome, Denise, and thank you for being here. 
Thank you for inviting me. We are also joined today by Dr. Chad Vickers. Dr. Chad is a dual certified advanced practice registered nurse specializing in psychiatric mental health and family practice. Having been a nurse practitioner since 2006, he has worked in a variety of settings to include both inpatient and outpatient settings, as well as a psychiatric emergency room. He has experience in treating people of all ages, as well as managing a variety of complex psychiatric diagnoses. In addition to his training as a nurse practitioner, he has earned a PhD in health studies with an emphasis on population health. He has served as faculty in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of North Texas Health Science Center and on the board of directors of the acclaimed physician group of John Peter Smith Hospital Network. He has previous recognitions as the John Peter Smith Hospital Network Department of Psychiatry Advanced Practice Provider of the Year, as well as the D Magazine Excellence in Nursing Award. Outside of his clinical practice, Chad is active in his community, serving as the secretary on the board of trustees for the city library, as well as the co-chair of his church's outreach committee. And Chad is also a member of our current mental health equity cohort for NBA. Thank you, Chad, for being here. Thank you, Jocelyn. Finally, on our panel today, we are joined by Reverend Alexis Lilly. Reverend Alexis serves as the associate pastor at the Church of the Village in New York City, where she is passionate about viewing the subversive life of Jesus as a blueprint for the systems inverting work of justice today. She graduated from Union Theological Seminary in 2014 with a Master of Divinity degree and is ordained with the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. In addition to prior pastoral roles across diverse faith communities, Alexis was an adjunct professor of Hebrew Bible and a chaplain in the Air Force Reserves. Alexis is also a trained mental health first aid instructor, and her first career in journalism and marketing continues to inform her ministry in the digital age. Thank you, Reverend Alexis, for being here with us today. Yeah, thank you. All right, so to get us started, I will invite Denise to open us up and share with us about suicide and mental health. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, suicide stigmatized. We we know that we have seen that. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about suicide today, and um, I'm going to give you some resources of what you can do. I'm going to start with statistics. Um, People might think that there is not a problem in suicide, but there is a problem of suicide in our in our world, especially in the United States. Where we live, sorry, but it's not moving. Second. Hope you can see my slides now. All right. So suicide is the 11 leading cause of death in the United States. Um, but it's really sad that is the second leading cause of death for children and adolescents and young adults, like from 10 to 24 years old. Um, in 2021, over 48,000 people died by suicide, 48,000 Americans actually, but 1.70 million people attempted suicide during the same day. So you can see the whole difference of like is a lot of people dying by suicide, but there is a lot more attempting suicide. Men die by suicide almost four times more than women. Um, and firearms, it's over half of the um, accounted for suicide deaths. Um, and also 10% of youth in the last youth survey, youth research um, behavior survey that is done across the United States, 10% of youth in grade 9 to 11, 9 to 12 reported that they have attempted suicide in the last year. So it's um, it's really sad. And I feel that there is something that we can do and we need to do. So the questions that everyone asks me is like, why people die by suicide, right? Like why people die by suicide? And research has shown that there's not only one reason why people die by suicide. There's a lot of like things that are happening in that person's life that the people decided to take their own life. Um, it could be personality, it could be um, situational, um, it could be emotional. And most of the time it's when all of those um, problems 
combined and they're like all together when people decided to take their own life. But it's not because they want to take their own life. It's not like I want to die. It's most of the time that my pain, what I'm going through, it's so hard that I cannot like handle it anymore. So the only exit that I see is like dying. Um, a lot of them feel that they're a burden to their families. So um, they feel that their families will be better off if they are not here. Um, many of them, most, most people who die by suicide suffer for a mental illness. Um, and a lot of those are not um, attended. They're not like um, help, uh, but that's one of the things that I want you to encourage you today and that we're going to be discussing really, really soon about what can we do to help those that are thinking about suicide. Um, but please know that a lot of people are ambivalent and that is the time that we can actually like make sure that those people are safe, like talking with them. So the first thing that we need to do or to know are the signs and symptoms. How can we prevent suicide? Okay, now I know that, that there's a lot of people dying by suicide, and that there's not only one reason which make it harder for me as a pastor or a leader um, in my congregation. Like, how can I know if a person is actually thinking about suicide? Um, so the first thing that I want you to encourage you to do is to know the signs and symptoms. Um, we have to like pay attention of the behavior, um, changing behavior. People are like using alcohol or drugs, um, social withdrawal. They're not coming um, to church anymore. They're not going to work. They lose their job. Um, lack of personal care, you know, taking care of themselves. I, they cannot concentrate. Um, a lot of times, um, pre previous suicide attempt or giving away their possessions, that's something that we need to pay attention to verbal when they're like talking about suicide but a lot of times they don't say i want to die um, sometimes they do but not not all the times we need to pay, pay attention to when they said like i'm a burden to those that are around me um i'm unable to bear like the pain i cannot go anymore um, i'm feeling trapped so pay attention to those verbal um cues personality when they have like anger outbursts depression and anxiety going back to their mental uh, mental illness, like paying attention to those signs and symptoms, feeling lonely, um, poor concentration. Um, so we need to pay attention to that. And then the situational, which I I feel that the situational is the easiest one, um, especially when, because when when I have talked to people that um, have loved ones that have died by suicide, they only pay attention to, oh, they lost their job or they got divorced. So those are the easiest one to identify, you know, because are the things that we can see. So we can see if they're like fired from their work or they're having financial issues or somebody in their family die. Um, if they're diagnosed with a, a terminal illness, uh, not only mental health, but also like physical health, um, fear of losing their freedom. Maybe they, they, um, they are gonna be arrested or they're gonna be expelled from school if they're like younger. So um, fear of those, so the situational. So paying attention to the behavior, the verbal, what they say, their personality, mental, mental illness or emotional and the situational. So, you know, I have this person in my congregation and I see that they are going through a lot. They lost their job, they are not attending church. Um, they were recently diagnosed with uh, with a depression and they have said that they're a burden to their family. So what I'm going to do, like how, how do I approach it? Um, and a lot of times I, I, I have talked to people and they feel afraid of asking a question. Like they're like, Ooh, I don't know what to do. Like, how do I approach if somebody is suicidal? The first thing that we need to do is talk to that person. Um, there is a program on the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention that is called Talk Save Life, and I, it truly saves lives. So talk to that person, like um, listen to their story. What what is going on? Um, I have seen that you are not attending church. I'm, I miss you. Um, is there anything that I can do? I heard that you said you're a burden to yourself or you're a burden to your family. So why do you feel that way? Investigate, like ask the questions. Tell them what you see. Um, be attentive to the warning signs. 
trust your instinct. If you are concerned about somebody, please assume that you're the only person that is concerned. Um, I have seen or work with families that they were all concerned about um, the loved one, but they talk about uh, among themselves, but nobody talked to the person that was in trouble. Um, so please make sure that you ask the person that it's that you're concerned about um, how they feel. Follow up with the person, not only like talk to them today and then like, oh, he said that he's not suicidal. She said that she's not suicidal, but follow up. Like, are you okay today? How, how are you doing? You know, in a week, like go and follow up again. Um, if you're concerned about them or they, they tell you that they're suicidal, please make sure that you call a family member, um, connect them with a doctor. And we're gonna like go over some phone numbers that you can you can call. Um, or even if they said that they are not actually, if they're saying that they're suicidal, please call um, 988 or 911 if there's like an immediate danger, call 911. Um, but if they said that they're feeling depressed or they're really sad, please call a family member um, and let them know, do not let them alone. Um, connect with them with someone. Encourage them to receive mental health services. As we're talking today, mental health is very stigmatized, um, but it's important that that we talk about like mental health and that those people who are thinking about suicide, it's the majority have a mental illness, that they get the help that they need. Um, and remember that talk saves lives. So the first thing is talk. And the last thing that I want you to leave today is like talk. Talk saves lives, so please talk to them. Um, the resources that I told you, the 988 number um, is easy to remember. It was years to advocate for the 988 number, so please feel free to use it. If you have somebody that you're concerned or if you have questions about mental health, you can call them. If it's an emergency like that, you know, it's a suicide suicide uh, that is on course, then call 911 or um, if the person is in immediate danger. Um, for the younger ones, they can text too. Now it's the 741-741, so it's easier for um, adolescents or young adults to to text um, nowadays. And there's also like the uh, a web page that you can get some information that is on the bottom of this page, um, 988lifeline.org, so you can um, contact them as well. And the Girls and Boys Town um, hotline is also there. So I don't know if anybody have questions or I think that we probably is gonna we're we are probably gonna leave the questions to the end, but thank you for um having me today and I hope that we work together to save some lives. Thank you so much, Denise, for just giving a wealth of information in a brief amount of time for those who are watching us, please do put your questions, your comments. Uh, in our Q&A feature or in the chat, because we definitely want to hear from you. And as we have these uh, professionals here with us to answer your questions or um, your thoughts on suicide, please do um, share that with us so that we can get those questions answered during this time. Thank you again, Denise. And again, we'll come back around to a fuller Q&A uh, once all of our presenters have finished. So we'll now invite Dr. Chad to come and talk to us a bit about medication and mental health, another area where there's quite a bit of stigma, especially when we think about um, in the church, uh, a lot of stigma around this. So Dr. Chad. Well, it's kind of hard to follow Denise, right? Having listened to her twice now, man, Denise, I could listen to you all day. You're kind of a legend, so. We appreciate that. I would like to offer a quick thanks to Jocelyn and NBA for asking me to be here today. I'm a little bit of a different type, I guess. I'm a psychopharmacologist, so it's a little bit of a different style. I'm not a therapist, so I think about medicine all day, every day. My grandmother was a pharmacist. My first job was in the pharmacy, so I, I really think about medicine. And so I, I appreciate Jocelyn asking me to attend. Jocelyn, thankfully, gave me some prompts, and I'll be honest and say I'm a little bit nervous because I do think differently, but Jocelyn gave me some prompts, so I'm going to go through what I think is important for us to know, what I think would be helpful for clients to know, where we can maybe go in the, in the long run. So 
So there are a number of ways, obviously, to treat mental health symptoms and meds are one of those, right? So it's not just medicine, it's not just therapy. Maybe it's a combination. Medicine is certainly important. Since COVID, we've seen an increase in the number of people reporting effective symptoms like depression as well as anxiety and ADHD even. This has resulted in an increase in psychopharmacological treatment. So people are asking more about medicine. I think people probably, in my career, I've done this 19 years now, people are probably more interested in medicine now than ever before. As Jocelyn mentioned earlier, most recent estimates are about 50% of Americans currently take mental health medicines. So it's a pretty big number. Life is not getting easier. Medicine can help with that, at least we hope. In 2021, the number of Americans taking mental health medications increased by 20%, and we expect to see that continue. So the American Psychiatric Association has said that probably is going to double, maybe quadruple in the next two years. So we're waiting to see the, the latest stats, but we are certainly moving up. And while medicine can be an effective tool to help manage uh, mental health symptoms, it can be quite challenging, as you all know, to find the right medication. And only about one third of people who first start antidepressants, for example, that's not to exclude antipsychotics, not to exclude anti-anxiety medicines, but antidepressants alone, only about one third of people who start antidep antidepressants find benefit. So that's pretty frustrating. I think as a provider, as a patient, it must be. On average, people may try between three and seven antidepressants before they find the one that is most helpful for their symptoms. We are fortunate, I say fortunate, uh, we are growing more fortunate, I should say, that there are some pharmacogenetic labs that we can now do that indicate what medicines might work better for people. And so we're getting that number down a little bit, but it's still frustrating for patients. So the other issue is obviously insurance is a barrier, cost is a barrier, uh, we do what we can, but it's, it's not great. So, and then medications also aren't without side effects and can be difficult to adjust, which further complicates symptoms, I think. So if people are already depressed and you're feeling side effect from your medicine, I'm saying go up on it, do something different. It, it's a bit of a challenge. So, and then when we think about stigma related to medicine, the stigma has not gotten, again, 19 years later, the stigma has not gotten any better, I don't think. Maybe Denise, Denise, maybe you could tell me it's gotten better. I hope so. For me in medicine, it doesn't feel like it's gotten any better. So people ask, is it going to work? What do I do if it doesn't work? What do I tell my family and friends and coworkers who don't believe in or understand mental health symptoms? Did I do something to cause this? If I, sh if, if I, if I share with my coworkers, what are they going to think? So I'll be honest, my partner is a disciples pastor and people ask him, like, is God punishing me? Like what? He comes home and says, what do I tell these people? Like, I, I, they ask me these questions. I don't know what to tell them. Uh, is God punishing me? Is medicine just a crutch? Shouldn't I be able to manage without medicine? Is medicine going to change my personality? Will people know I'm taking it? And then the most common thing I hear is, am I weak? If I take medicine, does that mean I'm less than? Of course not. But. And so what can we do as a disciples congregation? What can we do as a church? And again, these are conversations I have every day at home with my partner. I think we have to have open dialogue. I hear people in social settings say, I take this for blood pressure or I take that for diabetes, but no one's saying, hey, I take Prozac. 
but we should be, right? And then reassurance that mental health is no different than physical health. We're going to normalize those conditions, identifying congregants, uh, people that are in our congregation who might be willing to share stories regarding mental health. At our church, we do a moment of stewardship every week. And so we invite people to come up and talk about whatever is meaningful for them. And there have been times that people have talked about mental health, not often, unfortunately, but I'm encouraging that. I talk about it. But we invite people to come up and say, hey, this is what's going on. Here, here's, our, here's my stewardship. I go to this place. I do this thing. I think it's also helpful to have some information about local resources to share with people who may be struggling. So again, this is a bit personal, but for my partner, I put together a kind of brochure, a little packet for our area, for people that might be struggling and that needed something and that needed somewhere to go. And I think that if we just say, hey, look, here's where you can go, that goes a long way. Avoid telling people it'll all be fine. We are very dismissive, and I say we, meaning me, we're very dismissive when it comes to mental health, and we say, mm, just pray about it. But we should encourage appointments. Give supportive statements. What are your thoughts about possible benefits of medicine? Offer to sit with people. Offer to go to appointments. Offer to help. And then the last thing for me was follow up. So the decision to use, the decision to share the use of medicine can be a significant one of the medication and the medication, excuse me, medication journey isn't often an easy one. If people share that with us, I think that's super important. We should affirm their choice, offer interest and offer encouragement. We should encourage people, go with them, do what we can, just like we would when somebody says, I have cancer. Okay. You, you have depression. I will take you to your appointment. I'll sit with you through your medicine appointment. So, so Jocelyn, that's all I got. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chad. You know, that one thing that I want to say is I had no idea that there are labs that can be done now that would help to yeah. indicate what, what medication might work best for someone. And that that is huge um, because I know oftentimes a lot of people will begin a journey of beginning medication for their mental illness. And then because, as you said, it takes so many different so medications to try or changing the levels right. that they just get exhausted from that and say, you know what, I'm just not going to give up. Right. I mean, yeah. I would give up. Why not? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. 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 So I'm just grateful that there are technologies and, and new ways of thinking about how people um, get the right medication that they need. And to your point about encouragement, being able to encourage people to keep going, to stay the course when um, they're in need, because some people will have to be on medication for a mental illness for the rest of their lives. And, you know, to your point, doesn't mean that there's anything that's wrong with them or their faith or anything like that, but just inside of their body, they just need some other things. And that's, right. that's life. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, any questions that people have, again, please be sure to put that in the Q&A. And when we come to the end of all of the sharing, we will um, revisit those questions and those comments there. Thank you, Dr. Chad. You're very welcome. Just Chad. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, we will uh, have Reverend Alexis joined us to talk a little bit about mental health first aid and clergy responsiveness. Um, some of the ways that we can utilize the tools that are available to us to care for the mental health of our congregations in our communities. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Jocelyn, and, and thank you, everyone. I'm going to echo probably a number of things that have already been said, because there certainly is a lot of, I think, helpful overlap and dovetailing of our um, respective issues and, and areas of discussion. So an overview of mental health first aid. So, you know, I kind of want to also differentiate between like the organization that is mental health first aid. That's like the name of it. Um, that is where I am a certified mental health first aid instructor. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and then just more generally, like the importance of being trained and providing mental health first aid as um, as a resource. And it certainly doesn't have to only be done through the organization known as mental health first aid, but I'm, I just don't want to cause any confusion if I use those terms interchangeably. Um, but to, to kind of go into that mental health first aid more broadly, how I got into it um, was really, you know, it's, it's something that certainly has been an important piece of the work that I do in my role in as a pastor in a downtown church in Manhattan in New York City. And we have always had, at least as long as I've been in this community and, and certainly in prior communities that I've been at in the city, um, we've always had a handful of folks that have experienced some sort of mental health challenge or maybe been diagnosed with a mental illness in some point in their life or they're living with that currently. Um, and so, I, you know, I, over the years, it had been something that I had dealt with and that I would kind of find myself thinking from time to time, like, oh, it'd be nice if I, you know, knew a little bit more about this or had a little bit more actual, quote unquote, training. And then really in the last couple of years, as you know, you all have already referenced around COVID and those sorts of things. And I think a lot of us in congregations and organizations have certainly seen this just statistically, we've, we've seen the numbers, right? And um, that there's been an uptick. And so, yeah, for us in the last couple of years, really have noticed folks literally sometimes coming in off the street on a Sunday morning um, and various states of need and feeling there again, like, okay, I really want to be better equipped and help our church community be better equipped to respond to folks. So that was my own kind of journey into just mental health for state in general, and then finding the organization and, and doing the training with them myself as a way to kind of further educate myself and also potentially see if it might be something that other folks in the congregation would be interested in. And then obviously, yes, I thought that it is relevant because then I got certified um, to teach it as well. So I think when, when I'm thinking about like the impact of that on folks and on communities, specifically, you know, my own community, there is, it's, it's one more, it provides one more, well, a multiplicity of tools within this thing that we call mental health first aid. But, you know, I see mental health first aid as one more tool in my tool belt. So the, the training, at least now I'm talking more specifically about mental health first aid as the organization, the training that we do as mental health first aiders, I think it really helps people identify the type of situation we're entering. Um, and I think Denise, you talked about this when you talked about like asking those questions and making that approach and helping people have a positive interaction when you're talking to them. And that is a huge piece and, and mental health first aid does touch on the issue of suicide, but that's just you know one piece of the overall training. So I think that those frameworks for helping people figure out what type of situation they might be entering when they're engaging with someone and then how to interact helpfully and healthily in those sorts of situations across a variety of spectrums, all, you know, things that are, are relatively, I don't want to use the word minor, but, you know, are not an acute crisis all the way up to and including things that would be an, uh, an acute crisis. Um, and I think that one thing I've seen be really helpful for folks in our community as we've, you know, tried to, to do more education and things like that is, um, you know, Chad, you were mentioning this, like the resource list and having ways to refer people. I think that being able to A, have a sense of, of knowledge of a little bit more education of what I can do in a situation is helpful for people. And then a lot of, you know, it's first aid. So you're not, you're not the professional providing the ongoing care necessarily. Although, you know, for folks in a congregation, you might be walking that road with them in an ongoing way. But really I've seen it be helpful to help free 
folks in my community from that sense of like obligation that we have to be doing all the things for people. It's like, actually, it's great to refer people to XYZ organization. Um, and we've, you know, worked on developing closer relationships with places in our vicinity and things like that so that we don't feel like we have to, I mean, we can't be, but I think it's it's helping to release people from that sense of being all things to all people. And it's actually really good to utilize a well-developed list of referrals and resources and things like that. Um, so I think that's one, certainly one of the ways that just practically I've seen it be helpful for folks. Um, and then, you know, why, why is doing this work of further education on mental health first aid important. Um, we've talked about reducing stigma. And I think even just having, or as a congregation attending, or as a church offering some sort of training or conversation or thing like that, even just signaling that you're willing to address these topics can really help with that reduction of stigma in the community. And, um, I think one way that mental health first aid is really crucial for congregations and clergy is kind of going back to what I said before about the referral, but I think it's acknowledging what we do well already as communities of faith, which is walking alongside people, caring for people, you know, that that wanting to be all things to all people comes from a really lovely, lovely and loving place of really having deep care for people. And I think we do those things well often as communities of faith. And we can also give folks the permission to not do it all. So to to be able to acknowledge folks' desire to help accompany and support and validate them in releasing some of those things, you know, to that list that that did you had those list of resources and you know, we have location specific lists and things like that. Um, and letting, having them feel like they're not doing nothing, uh, but they don't have to take it all on, right? And then of course, thinking about the importance that this has on the people that we are desiring to help, right? So there's that level of hopefully we're able to connect them to resources. And, um, you know, I, I spoke about this to another group yesterday and this came up that like, that is also not perfect. We certainly have a lack of resources in a lot of ways and there's a lot of problems there. So I, you know, I don't want to not mention that um, it's not perfect. And I think being able to, especially as faith communities continue the things that they're good at, which is some of that relationship building with other organizations and the community and things like that, having relationships where you can send someone somewhere and know hope, trust that they're going to get taken care of. And you're not just like saying, sorry, can't help you, you know, move along. Um, that is a real impact on folks that are seeking help and learning ways of more healthily engaging with folks. I think that is also, you know, also a real impact of congregations and faith communities and organizations having a little bit more deeper understanding of mental health challenges and struggles, you know, like, um, I certainly have, I have personally learned a lot in how to help better and how to deal with some folks in our community specifically that um, have mental health challenges or maybe even diagnosed mental illnesses. Um, so, you know, that those are just some examples of ways that I think that this work is important and impactful. And like I said, it's not a bullet, it's not a bullet, it's not a silver bullet, it's not a panacea. Um, there are certainly holes and flaws and, you know, we're in some ways we're just like cobbling together the best system that we can um, while, while fighting a system that is seemingly designed to not take care of people. So I do want to acknowledge that as well. And then um, Jocelyn asked me to just say a bit about how folks can access the Health First Aid course. So again, going back to Mental Health First Aid as the organization, um, I will put some links in the chat, but that is a resource for folks. There are all the instructors that host courses and a lot of them are virtual and obviously able to be joined from anywhere. We all list our courses there. So you can certainly find if you're interested just as an individual or maybe just as a couple people in finding a course that would work for you, you can search that. Um, I'll put my list of courses for the rest of this month is how far I've scheduled it out. And then certainly I, I would love to talk further. Um, I think it's really beneficial when communities train together. So, you know, if you're part of a community or you feel like 
there's a need in your church or organization or something like that, and you would like to do a training with, with you know, specific to that organization um, with people that you're already in community with, I'd love to talk more about that too. And I can, I will put my contact info in the chat. So that's, that's what I've got so far. I'm happy to talk more and take questions as we go on. Thank you so much, Reverend Alexis. Um, could you really briefly just say a little bit more about the, um, you know, the course in itself, like the uh, the length of time, those sorts of um, pieces? Sure. Yes. All the, the fun logistical things. Yes. So a virtual course is typically about five and a half hours of, you know, session time on Zoom. And there's a little bit in a virtual course, there's a little bit of work that folks do beforehand to just kind of come prepped with some of the, you know, basic ideas. And then we unpack those as we go throughout. And it really focuses kind of like I alluded to on the framework that they provide for some helpful ways to enter a situation to do that initial assessment and figure out where are you in, in the spectrum of immediacy to escalation to um, a crisis situations. And that's also, um, you know, those are a little bit different based on, you know, are you in community with this person? Is this person walking in off the street? Are you coming across this person out in the world? So there's a whole range of ways that someone might come across someone that they're hoping to help. Um, so it really takes that framework and then spends the rest of the day going through practical applications of that framework to a whole variety of settings. And there's, you know, a lot of um, uh, scenarios and, you know, watching videos and kind of seeing what's happening in this series of escalating events and talking about how that applies in your own situations and things like that. Um, and then there is an in-person option and that's a little bit, that's a little bit different because there's not, you don't come prepped with work. You just kind of sit down for a full day of like seven-ish hours and have actual like course materials. You know, it's a much more of like kind of the workshop-y type things that I think most of us are probably familiar with. So um, this question here is the first day of course all in one sitting. Yes, yeah, the virtual one, especially the in-person ones I've, seen it done a little bit more customizable where folks might break it up over two days, but um, typically, yes, it's all all in one day, all in one session that you don't, you're taking breaks and things, literally all just sitting for that whole time. But yeah, it's all at once. Okay, thank you for that. I'll invite all of our panelists to come back on camera um, as we go into our final question and answer. So again, if there are any additional questions or comments from our viewers, please do put them in the, the chat or the question and answer feature now. And we do have a question here that I just wanna to pose to the group, whoever you know has a response. Um, in Northern California, Nevada region, we have been trying to find providers to conduct workshops for congregations and organizations. Many of our providers are overwhelmed serving clients, where do we go to find qualified presenters? So I wonder if anyone has some thoughts on that question here. And one thing that I will I, say, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, Justin. Okay. Um, one thing uh, that I was going to say is that we are, please, you can reach out to us at MBA. That's one thing um, because we do try to connect our regions with mental health professionals that we are connected to as well as mental health professionals that we may know of in your community. And so that is one uh, one of the resources that you know you can reach out about for speakers. Yeah, I mean, that's, I was gonna suggest something similar. Um... And I, I don't know if you're if you're specifically looking for someone in that area because yes, of course, um, I can't speak to that. But I think that is one way that that some of this virtual stuff has certainly opened up resources. Is um, you don't necessarily have to be. I'm, again, I'm not sure exactly what you're looking for, so maybe you do need to be local, but you don't necessarily have to be restricted by um, having to be in that area. So that's you know just considering like organizations that may be beyond or be national or something like that could potentially help. 
Also, depending on the topic that they're looking for. So if it's for suicide prevention, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, they have like um, several trainings that they do and there's a chapter in every state. Um, you can contact them, they do provide trainings. Um, if it's for mental health, um, National Alliance on Mental Illness, I saw that somebody put it in there. Um, we do have mental health um, mental health organization here that is actually called mental health <laughs> organization. Um, and also you will need to kind of like uh, partner up or see what resources are in your community. Um, it takes time, but then when you are in need, it's easier. So it, you will have to invest the time on like getting to know your community, like what the resources are, but it's really important that you do so. So when you are um, in need of services for somebody in your congregation, then you, you have those resources handy. Yeah, I also would um, suggest outside of the national organizations or the chapters in your area um, to be able to do a search um, on like a psychology today for putting in the zip code of the area that you're in and reaching out to some of those providers who may be on that list. Because sometimes there are mental health providers who want to get involved in doing more workshops or um, connecting, and they're not sure of how to get connected. And so if you are looking for people, um, just doing that search, sending an email out and seeing, you know, who may be available um, to do that sort of work, because there are uh, mental health professionals who are looking to do more workshops and, you know, extend their work in that area. Okay. So if we have any other questions, please do let us know. But before we close up, I do want to just take a moment to see if there's anything else that our panelists want to share, any last words or things that have come back to mind as we've gone throughout this entire conversation this afternoon, this morning, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, any last thoughts or resources? I had to comment on... Uh... Dr. Vickers, um, I do feel that there is a lot to go, a long way to go regarding stigma. I do feel that compared with like 20 years ago, we have come like a long way before, like it wasn't even a topic. We were not being invited anywhere to talk about like mental health. So now at least like people are listening, they still like on that first stages. <laughs> um, and and my goal, I do agree with you. My goal is like yours. Like, I just want people to see mental health the same way that they see physical health. You know, like you, you get uh, the flu, you go to the doctor, you get depression, you go to see a mental health um, counselor. So I hope that uh, before I uh, go to heaven, I can experience that and see that people take mental health seriously the same way that they do with their physical health. I agree. So. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that, like I said, I, um, I talked in, to another group similarly yesterday. And one thing that we were talking about was, you know, how to kind of quote, normalize some of these things. And I think, you know, in New York, maybe we're a little bit different because it's, it's total or, and, or in this congregation, it's like totally, um, usual to talk about like your therapist and you know your journey and your medication and I frequently in sermons say you know my therapist said blah 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 so I think even just like those of us in leadership and places like that just kind of like putting those little things in um, can be really helpful and then I think you know I, I also concur I mean Denise you were really raising up this importance of talking especially as it relates to suicide prevention and I think that's certainly true across the board and it's challenging. I mean, that's something that I've kind of had to learn the hard way in terms of even just checking in on folks that I know are in 12 step programs and, and you know, things like that. Folks that have, have a, um, you know, a history of incarceration and, and really just asking pointed questions in community, you know, people that are part of our community that we have built trust with, but really asking those pointed questions around like, how is your sobriety journey? Like, how is you, you know, have you found X, Y, Z since you've been out of incarceration, you know, those sorts of things um, to not shy away from those tough questions and assume everything's okay if things seem like they're okay. Um, so that certainly goes with, I know when you do suicide prevention training and I think it's like 
true in so many places and it's hard, but I think it's really, really important. Well, thank you all so much for all that you have shared, um, a, a wealth of information in a short amount of time, uh, the resources that you have shared and the inspiration that you have given to those who have been watching us. Uh, one thing that you know just came to my mind as you all were talking, uh, especially regarding medication and when we think about our spirituality and just how we feel about people receiving additional care for their mental health outside of praying and, um, you know, reading your Bible, but thinking about the ways that we can use prayer. I had a situation many years ago with someone who talked about how they were praying for a family member to no longer have to be on medication for schizophrenia. Uh, or how they were praying that God would heal this family member from schizophrenia. And I said to them, have you ever prayed maybe that they would take their medicine, that they would be compliant? Have you prayed that they would go to their appointments? Did you, have you prayed that they would continue their therapy? You know, all of the pieces that are a part of them receiving the care that they need to take care of what's happening with their brain, right? Because we want to normalize it's just something happening with someone and they need this extra care. And I remember weeks later, they said, oh my gosh, that really changed my perspective on my family member to think, no, let me pray that they're doing the things that they need to be well. And so when we think about our, our mental health, as it has been said many times, we want to look at it as a part of our health. And there are a variety of things that we have to do to keep ourselves well. For some of us, it will be taking medication um, for a small amount of time or a long amount of time. I have no problem saying that many years ago, I had to take antidepressants for a year. And I am so grateful that I had that available to me. And then when I didn't need it anymore, I was able to you know, wean off of the medication. Um, and I know people who have to be on medications for the rest of their lives, as we said. And so um, or they've had suicidal ideations um, or, you know, they've attempted suicide and they've been able to get the support that they need to move through that. And so, you know, we want to shift our perspective, right, on the ways that we can be present to people who are experiencing challenges with their mental health, um, because we all will experience some challenges in this world that we live in. Uh, we know that the Bible says, take heart. You will experience some challenges in this world. Uh, but we thank God that a part of the abundance that is available to us, our mental health professionals, our people who have mental health first aid training, our people who are able to give us medications and, and help us and accompany us on the journey. So we thank you, uh, Reverend Alexis, Dr. Chad, and Denise again. And we are blessed by your work and we're honored to receive your wisdom and your professional and clinical expertise. And we pray that you will continue to be blessed in the work that you do in this world to keep us well and to keep us safe. And to everyone who has watched uh, this webinar, we thank you for your commitment to wanting to make sure that the mental health of yourself and those that you are uh, serving or just being with, um, that they will be well and be safe. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. It will be available for future viewing on our website at mbacares.org. And one of the ways that you can stay informed of our work and be involved is to sign up for our newsletter at mbacares.org backslash newsletter. And there are a few check boxes you can mark to let us know you're interested in mental health and wellness topics. Finally, if you would like to support our work further, of mental health and wellness. We welcome your financial support. We're forever grateful for those blessings and you can donate online at mbacares.org backslash donate. So as we leave this space today, may you remember to center your mental health and wellness. May you be supported by community for sustainable care. May you be empowered to overcome stigma and increase support. May your mind, body, and spirit be replenished each and every day. May you remember that God wants you to be well, not just so you can serve, but because God loves you and sees you as good. Grace and peace be with you. Thank you. 
Thank you all.